Hey, what's up? This is JM, host of the Celebrity Grill Podcast on iTunes, and you're listening to the Barbecue Central Radio Network. All barbecue and grilling, all the time. Start the game! Let's go! We'll do it live. Okay. Well, do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure you say whatever? We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. Welcome to the really big barbecue central show. This is the show that talks about all things important to the world of barbecue and grilling. Originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame city of Cleveland, Ohio. It is the barbecue capital of the North Coast. I'm your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday. If you want to jump in this evening, it's a phone call, 216-777-2120. Again, that's 216-777-2120. We are down a phone screener tonight, that being Michigan John. He's on business. However, I do have the call-in program set up to automatically accept your call so you don't have to play through a screener like you have had to do in weeks past. Basically, you just... Dial the number. It will get added into the show. You will know you're connected because you will hear the show happening live. You'll be hearing the show feed. Now, it might take two minutes. It might take 35 minutes. I might never get to your call depending on how the show is going. But please don't let that discourage you from calling in 216-777-2120. Maybe I can get you up when we have a guest. Maybe not, depending on what kind of technology we're using with that particular guest. But Give it a shot. Now, if you'd like to forego the phone call, I certainly understand. You'd rather shoot me an email. This is how you do that. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to greg at bbqcentralshow.com or on the Twitter and Instagrams at bbqcentralshow. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, thebbqcentralshow.com. And here's what's happening on the show tonight. And boy, is it a big one. Coming up in about 12 minutes from now, somebody that I have just re- been around the industry for as long as I've been doing the original podcast, right around that 2005, 2006 area. So as long as I have been in this space, he has also been in this space. I don't know how I didn't know about him until I'm trying to figure out how I even found the video that he was in. Maybe I was searching dry age steak. I think actually it was me searching videos on Pat LaFrieda because I'm still working on getting him on the show amongst some other things. And then after a YouTube video, it comes, hey, recommended for you are these 57 different videos that may or may not hold any interest to me. But I saw my next guest on a video and it was called like the dry age steak test. And one was 30 days and one was 60 days. And then it got outraged, 180 days. I think he actually ate a 400 and... 75-day dry-aged piece of beef. And I was immediately enamored with him, started watching all the videos, doing all the research on his background, visiting his website, doing Google name search, all that stuff. And I said, man, got to get this guy on the show, ASAFP, so we can talk about steak, we can talk about his background in case you don't know who he is. And he also seems like a guy that's ready to go off the cuff. Ask him a question, he'll answer it. He'll give you his absolute definitive opinion. Now, whether you agree with it or not, that's for you to agree or disagree with. But from a host perspective, I anticipate we're going to have a pretty healthy conversation going back and forth. And of course, you know me, if I don't agree, I'll be more than happy to point that out and we can go back and forth, kind of like I do with Meathead and some of the other guests from time to time. So joining me for the very first time is professional carnivore Nick Solaris. 
NickSolaris.com. If you don't know who he is, check him out. So very much looking forward to hooking up with Nick here for the first time and uh, potentially starting an engaging and recurring relationship. At 9.35, a guest who has been on this show for any number of years. First, you saw him appear on this show when he secured the contract with Kansas City's Barbecue Society being their marketing partner, the CEO and president of MMA Creative. But within the last six years, and certainly he's still doing that and being very successful at that, he's also happened to create, I guess, what would arguably be the largest competitive food sport event that happens during the course of a calendar year with that major event in November, but then sprinkled all the way through the different weeks and months of the year. And as we know, 2018 rapidly coming to a close, the creator of the World Food Championships with some big news breaking tonight at 935, Mike McLeod will be on the show. And then we'll kick it over to the second hour and the fourth Tuesday of every month. In the second hour is none other than a refiring of the embedded correspondence segment. Texas, Doug Scheiding, Oklahoma, David Huff, and Tennessee, Steve Ray are all ready to go and give us their findings on what I have termed the purposeful undercooking of steaks across this great land of ours. So they hit up steak restaurants. In full disclosure, I did not hold up my end of the bargain. I'm not even going to lie about it. I will take some in the second hour. So if you like me getting some, be sure to tune in or at least get it in podcast. You can subscribe to the show on podcast on all platforms. I'll get into that in the second hour as well at the top. So look forward to the Embedded Correspondent segment as I always do each and every month. Last week, I led the show by telling you that my steak game was struggling a little bit. And I did nothing to help myself out this past week. You know, as we talk to the pitmasters each and every week here, especially when I was a little bit more on the competition side of things, it was always practice. Write down your notes. Replicate. Consistency. That's how you're going to improve your cooks when it comes to live fire, whether it be barbecue or grilling. I did not do any extra cooks. I did not help, my, uh, I did not help myself try to get better last week. But I did want to give you that full disclosure that at least over the last couple cooks, and I know why, I mean, just some adjustments on my end, but the steak game faltered just a little bit. But I can tell you with 100% assurity, my rib game is as strong as it has ever been. Strong as it has ever been. Competition quality, doubt it, but I'm not trying to make competition style ribs at home. Probably just like the majority of you guys and gals that compete, you're not looking to do the same kind of rib that you're turning in into competition in your backyard for family and friends. Saturday, I think, honestly, I made the best ribs to date. I used some of the newly gifted meat church rubs that Matt Pittman sent me. So shout out to Matt Pittman. I hate saying shout out, but fell into that trap. Also, maybe you saw it in the open. Sporting some of the new shirts that Matt sent me as well. I have uh, Barbecue AF. We talked about that. As we call it, Barbecue as Friends. Thank you, Stover Harger, on that one. And I used Matt's Honey Hog Rub only. A brief spray of avocado oil as the adherent. Then a large platform of Honey Hog Rub. Then... Traeger Timberline 850, 225, super smoke setting. And these ribs were calling. I had zero plans on cooking ribs Saturday. And I got through the grocery store, the grocery store of all places. And these ribs, St. Louis style, calling my name amongst the 40 or 50 other St. Louis racks that were in there. I picked it up. It was thick all the way through. The bones on the back were incredibly straight. I said, self? I didn't have any plans to cook ribs, but we're going to be doing some ribs tonight. Got home, fired up the Traeger Timberline. Again, 225 Super Smoke setting, put the ribs in and said, however long this is going to take, that's how long it will take. Went back to 100% simplicity. 
No cooking timeline. Use the Ben test. Also, no foil. And I'm telling you, simple, delicious. You know, sometimes I think we get so involved in trying to add this or do that. And we get bogged down into barbecue minutia. For these cases alone, simplicity is actually the best. And letting that barbecue telling you when it's done and not the other way around. So here's my advice. If you've been struggling or you used to make really good ribs and something has changed, make a note of what's changed. What did you used to do? I bet it was a lot simpler methods. Go back to the simple ways and see if that doesn't correct your issue. Corrected mine. Wow. They were unbelievable. And that Timberline, rock solid, super smoke ring. Believe it or not, pellet grills get a really bad rap about not giving you that smoke and that that smoke ring. Timberline knocks it out. Love that cooker. All right, Nick Solaris coming up out of the break. Let me talk to you quickly about Southside Market and Barbecue. Attention folks in the business of barbecue. Established in 1882, Southside Market Barbecue, the oldest barbecue joint in Texas. And they've been owned and operated by the same family for three generations. They offer premium Central Texas barbecue products, slow-smoked over real post oak wood, shipping, distributing, and manufacturing sausages for companies across the U.S. From food trucks to multi-chain restaurants, Southside Sausage can be on your menu, too. That's right. I'll talk to you about that here in a second. All meats are processed on their on-site USDA-inspected facility, trusted partner with a focus on quality, and most importantly, authenticity. Wholesale options available, shipping nationwide via the FedEx or food service distribution via Cisco, U.S. Foods, and Martin Foods, some of the biggest players in the distribution food game. Co-packaging available from research and development to package completion. They can follow your recipe or help you develop something brand new. Here's what I'm talking about. Private label options. I talk to you about it each and every week. If you don't want to do the research and development, if you don't want to come up with your own recipe, if you like Southside Market and barbecue sausages or products, they will let you put your brand name on their already tried and two products. Now you can easily add a product line, bring in a new revenue stream. Southside Market, they are selling their products, so they're happy along to do it. Come on. You kidding me? Get online and check it out right now. Southsidemarket.com. That's southsidemarket.com for podcasters only and live listeners. 10% off your online orders when you use code BBQ Central. That's one word, lowercase, BBQ Central. 10% off all online orders when you visit southsidemarket.com. All right, Nick Solar is coming up out of the break. Stick around. We'll be right back. Casting live from the Barbecue Central Show Studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. This portion of the show being brought to you by Butcher Barbecue, makers of award-winning injections, marinades, rubs, seasonings, barbecue sauces, grilling oils. All the Butcher Barbecue products have been tested on the competition circuit as well as in the backyard worldwide. Be the pit master of your neighborhood. Visit ButcherBBQ.com to stock up right now. Always trust your butcher. And let me tell you, little secret, while those best ribs I ever made were taking a sweet smoke nap in the Timberline 850, every hour I went out with the honey-flavored Butcher Barbecue grilling oil, light coat to keep that meat nice and succulent. Telling you, it was a winning night. Hey, my first guest getting ready to launch his new meat show on YouTube very shortly in the fall. You might know him for his musings on Eater, guest appearances on the OP podcast, along with his other YouTube videos. Let's head to the Traeger Grills hotline and welcome in first timer to the show, Nick Solaris. Nick, how are you, buddy? Hello, how are you? I'm doing absolutely fabulous. Nick, appreciate you making time for the show this evening. And uh, I guess before we dig into some meat talk and 
uh, some of your background initially. I know a couple weeks ago, uh, the Windy City smokeout happened, and uh, if my stalking of your social media feeds was correct, you were at least uh, a participant in some form or fashion going into that. I was a participant in the sense that I was consuming as much barbecue <laughs> and local Chicago meats and also some Japanese Wagyu. Um, I was there really at the uh, as a guest of RPM Steak, which is... If you've been to Chicago, if you love beef, if you haven't been to Chicago and you love beef, this is a place to go. It's one of the most impressive beef menus I've ever seen. Literally three types of Wagyu from Japan. Mm. Domestic Wagyu Angus hybrid. I call that a Wangus. Um, USDA Prime from Master Purveyors here in New York City, one of the oldest dry aging rooms in uh, in maybe the oldest dry aging room in the Eastern Seaboard. I'm not sure, but a very old room. Um, and then on top of that, some of the really, to my mind, some of the real masters of, of contemporary barbecue. Um, Pat Martin was there, Sam Jones, Billy Durney, who is a, a New York City boy, but I think is cooking world class barbecue. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he doesn't like being called the New York City barbecue chef. And I can't say I blame him considering the rather unillustrious history of this place. But. Last five years, New York City barbecue has really come a long way. Um, getting back to Chicago, though, there was um, Mike Mills was there. The guys from Home Team in uh, in South Carolina in uh, South Carolina were there. It was really a who's who of some of America's top pit masters. Uh, Wayne Miller did a, a demonstration. Myron Mixon was there. So. What I really liked about this festival was that it was a country music, and I'm not a big fan of country music, but I love when you have music in conjunction with food, because it sort of makes it more about what I think barbecue is about. It's not just about the food. It's about the camaraderie. It's about hospitality. It's about celebration. And I think that music and and a smoked meat component is just a an, an amazing confluence of things. What's the so, what was the best thing that you ate there? Can you put a, a specific pin? You mean pin? actually at the at the event? Well, I guess if you were traveling, I mean certainly the event is in and of itself probably a big barbecue situation. But as you're traveling around there in Chicago during your time, was there one culinary dish that stood out above the rest? Well, I I did a flight of beef at RPM Steak. But that included, as I was saying before, true Japanese Wagyu, some domestic wa- um, Wagyu blends. Uh, it was just, it was a tour de force of beef. But nothing really, that was such a luxury experience that I don't really equate mm. that with Chicago specifically. Like, that's the kind of thing that happens on a restaurant level that is sort of beyond, it, it's beyond region or geography as much as it is to do with, you know, the, a great exploration of wealth because that was that was a you know that was an expensive flight of beef um at the same place i had um i don't know if you guys are familiar with wagyu mafia here is a uh, it's a friend of mine hisato from tokyo and he he specializes in a fillet cutlet sandwich hmm. now this is something that is becoming it's become quite big in japan and he's sort of taking it along the uh, around the world and it's becoming popular in places like you see it popping up on menus here and what it is is a piece of filet mignon uh, tenderloin breaded in panko breadcrumbs deep fried served on basically what is kind of white bread but it's japanese milk toast so it's a little thicker than like your average white loaf and that's often toasted um that is served as a sandwich they they trim the uh, crust off and it's pretty expensive because wagyu beef is is rather expensive. You're paying by the ounce, I would assume. Yeah, it's. I think the sandwiches they go for something like, I, I think it's over 150 dollars. <laughs> like, how big is the sandwich? It's you know, it's probably uh, the sandwich is is not big. It's the it, imagine a, a piece of average white bread and then having the crust cut off. Yeah, yeah. Not big, but then again, Wagyu. If, if you guys are familiar with it, it's so rich that really, and it's deep fried too. So you're in, you, the the factor of <laughs> of the the richness of the dish, not just the expense, but but the actual richness of the of the flavor, um, means that you really can't eat too many of it. You know, you can't eat too much of it. Is that a bucket uh, list item? Would you say? I would say it's a once in a lifetime thing. The, you know, the the really they have them in Japan also. I've had some very good versions in Japan. 
Um, but I think it's one of those things that that's not really the, the true expression of Wagyu beef. I think if you've never had Wagyu, that that's not the way to do it. Um, the way to do it is really to, to taste the flavor of the actual steak or however you have it prepared. Um, but getting back to Chicago, um, you know, I love the, um, the Italian beef. I, I went to mm -hmm. Al's mm -hmm. as my first. Now, look, maybe if I'd went to, to another place like Bari uh, or Johnny's, maybe that would have been my would have been my, you know, the most redolent one. But Al's just really blew my mind. I've had I don't know how many beef sandwiches from, you know, French dips to barbecue style to Philly cheesesteaks. You know, you think that over the course of how, you know, I'm almost 50 years old now, over the course of eating these things over, you know, five decades almost, you would, you know, you'd kind of tasted every sort of combination. And this one, it's, you know, they dip them so that the outside is completely soggy, soaked in au jus. It's like tissue paper. And then the meat itself is, is almost, it's almost as, as soft and yielding. It's, uh, it's, it's top round. But it's sliced very thin, mm -hmm. and then they serve it with a jardinier, which is a sort of a play on an Italian type, uh, fresh, vinegary, spicy uh, salad that has a lot of peppers, maybe some pickled cauliflower and some other uh, other spices. And a lot of the times it'll be quite hot, and I think that heat really is a nice offset to the richness of the uh, the jus. Uh, so that that sandwich was really, to me, was was probably the highlight. Um, in terms of sort of opening my eyes to something new. I've had Waggy before. Uh, I also had Chicago deep dish pizza, which if you get it with a uh, sausage in it, it's practically a steak. Uh, I've so heard, much meat. There's so much meat in that thing. It's ridiculous. I've heard that's only a tourist thing. Like real Chicagoans don't actually eat deep dish pizza. It's a lot more of a thin crust. I don't believe that because there's, really? there's enough, there's enough small, really sort of eclectic off the beaten path places that serve it. That I, I, you know, I think that that's that's all that's that's a that's a tourist myth about tourist myths. Hmm. <laughs> um, but certainly, you know, if you go like if you go downtown to where where Pizzeria Uno and Duo are, yeah, you know, they they traffic and Luminati they they traffic on their on their fame a lot. There's no doubt. Um, is it the best pizza I've ever had? I uh, no. It's an experience. It's look, I I wouldn't want to eat I wouldn't want to eat anything else there, and I wouldn't want to eat that anywhere else. Nick Solaris joining me here on the show, nicksolaris.com on the Twitter, Nick underscore Solaris on Instagram at Nick Solaris. Are you a hot dog guy, Nick? I love hot dogs. Yeah. Uh, that's the other thing I experienced in Chicago was Chicago the uh, Chicago hot dog, which yep. um you know, it's a bit it's hard to corral the whole thing and there's a lot, you know, it all it, it's it, it's it's not a tidy hot dog, but man, I really I love the Vienna beef hot dog. I have to say, I feel almost uh, you know I live in New York now, and I feel that um, you know I'm a little disloyal to the to the local New York hot dog, which is which is a garlicky yeah. kosher dog. It's a sabret, right? Yeah, sabret, yeah. pretty much. Like if you think about it, it's sabret, or if you look at like Nathan's and mm -hmm. Katz's and Papaya King, they're, they're all made at Marathon. So Marathon make the hot dogs for a lot of the local places, um, which it's great in the same way that Vienna beef supply a lot of the hot dog places in Chicago. I happen to prefer the Vienna beef hot dog. It's got a sweeter disposition. It's a little more, a little more fragrant. It doesn't have that dense. I find New York hot dogs very, and I love them. Don't get me wrong. I'd rather eat that than any vegetable or fish or anything, <laughs> but they, I find it a bit heavy on the garlic and, mm. and you know, the, the Chicago hot dog is a little lighter. And then they put all that other stuff on it, and it sort of it really does become palate engaging. Would you ever boil a hot dog? You know, I saw that that was a topic of. <laughs> I mean, I look, had well. Every, let me let me. It's a, it's a loaded question, I, Nick, because I had Stephen Reichlin on last week, and we were talking about hot dogs on purpose. And then I happened to mention that I, from time to time, enjoy a boiled hot dog and he said he you know held up the fingers and said there was sacrilege and said there was a tenth circle of hell for those people that like boiled hot dogs and uh, you know we've had this illustrious relationship over these many years he shows up once a once a month on my show and i'm like geez that might be the last time he ever shows up on my show i thought we 
you know, hit a little bit of a nerve there. So I'm just kind of gauging where boiled hot dogs fall into the people that are in that live fire barbecue grilling industry. I mean, he's acting as if he put ketchup on the damn thing. Of course I did. Are you kidding me? That's delicious. <laughs> Jeez, I'm hitting all the wrong marks, but hey, it's, no, I, uh, I always trust my I pal. live in New York City. Yep. Uh, most of the hot dogs that you eat on the street here, there's, they're actually, I have to say that they're, the, the hot dog carts are a dying breed, but mm. those hot dog carts are all boiled. I mean, it's, they're, you know, there is something up about boiling a hot dog that, it gives the hot dog a certain, especially if it's if it's a natural casing. It gives it a certain plumpness. It doesn't, you know, when you when you grill or otherwise cook, or even griddle cook the hot dogs, especially a natural casing, it can kind of wilt, mm -hmm. right? It can kind of prune up a little bit, especially if it gets cooked and then lets rest. Uh, a, a boiled hot dog will always retain. It's like a sous vide for it, right? It's just this warm, nurturing bath that just keeps it in its perfect nubile state. Uh, I'm not against boiling hot dogs. Let's get a quick background on you before we jump into some steak here as uh, time is evaporating quickly. Uh, when you were growing up, did you come from a family that was well-versed in culinary skills that, like, you know, mom taking you to the kitchen or anything like that? Or did you find a, a love for food? like in a professional sense later in life? Um, I've always enjoyed food. My my mother, has been, I shouldn't even admit this on a barbecue show, but my mother's <laughs> been a vegetarian since like 77. So I'm sure that like my entire career choice was some form of rebellion. Right. Um, but she always cooked. I mean, I grew up in, I grew up in England in the seventies and into the eighties, but she was always kind of health conscious. So I grew up eating a rather bland, but yet healthy diet. And I think that what it did is, one, it gave me this yearning to eat real food. Um, but also, it kind of just gave me like a blank canvas. So when I got into adulthood and sort of became self-sufficient financially and was able to explore, you know, by this time I had moved to America when I was 16, um, you know, I really fell in love with American vernacular cooking. And also English. I, I love English working class foods like steak and kidney pies and all those kind of things. But it was, you know, food was always just something that I sort of enjoyed in in a non in a non quantified way. And that kind of held true all the way up until about 2001 when I had developed a terrible addiction to Smith & Walensky Steakhouse. And I would, <laughs> I would go there almost every Sunday wow. and, and eat the pro what ended up being the same dish and the same meal every Sunday. And that dish is the uh, prime rib um, with hash browns and cream spinach. And after a few years of eating that, it's, by the way, that is still the best thing I've ever eaten. Really? And this, yeah, it's still the best thing. And I, I'm, my entire career is trying, my, my entire career started as a hobby and that hobby started trying to find something better to eat than the Smith & Walensky prime rib. Do you find that the Smith & Walensky is, I mean, do you be honest with yourself and say, hey, there is some percentage of nostalgia that is tied into this whole thing. I was going every Sunday. I, you know, no, I love this no, dish, all that no, stuff. There's no doubt about that, yep. but that's but that's true of every piece of food that I love. Like I don't disassociate the food object, and especially because I I'm talking I, I'm talking about restaurants, and I just that's really what I I I deal with restaurants, you know, as a food writer. It's it's a you know I do if I can cook at home, but why would I? I know all these amazing meat chefs, so <laughs> I I there is there of course is the rose tinting of the nostalgia, right? But that to me is not that's part of it. You know, your prejudices, your your loves, all of those things are, are part of the filter that defines what defines you. And to me, it's like I've been to Japan, I've been to Spain and, and Italy and Scotland and, you know, Ireland. And I've had amazing beef and all of those beefs are, are great expressions of the and the terroir of the of where they are. But still, that's, you know, that piece of prime rib. It just to me, first of all, prime rib is my favorite dish. Mm -hmm. um, I love steak. Steak has its, you know, it has it has its great benefits. It has its its great high points. But to me, prime rib sort of embodies all of the great things about meat cooking. So you get that, you do get that upfront beefiness of the steak, but then you get those gentle roasted 
dark, warming meat notes of like stews and beef bourguignons. Uh, you get that sort of s- that slight smokiness that you get from barbecue. You get that not a smoke ring as much as you get that sort of you get that crunchy exterior yielding to that really soft inner flesh. So to me, prime rib is like the sort of near plus ultra of what you can do with beef. It just brings about all of the of the really great aspects of beef cooking. Um, so that said, I, I, I became determined to find, you know, to find a better piece of meat than that. And that at the time, you know, this was really before the internet was a valuable resource or something as niche as beef eating. Mm-hmm. So I got the Zagat guide, which at the time was really what, you know, f- for the 20 years that I lived in New York prior to that was, uh, was what Yelp and google was in the in the pre-digital age and zagat is basically a guide of restaurants for those that don't know it because it's sort of become a a digital brand at this point and i went through what at the time was about 30 steakhouses and ended up eating at all of them over the course of probably a couple of years and and started taking notes and you know discovered I'd been to Peter Luger's and I'd been to Keen's, but there were so many niche places that, you know, that were just off the radar and discovered some fantastic places like Porterhouse Bar and Grill, uh, Mark Joseph, and that Wolfgang's opened up shortly after I started the project. So I really, you know, I, I kind of got a real foothold and I had a really good foundation about what steak was traditionally in New York. And I then started writing keeping a journal it became it was a website initially called beef aficionado um that lasted about a year but it was you know this was in the sort of very early stages um of food online so i had set it up with like a forum and a calendar and all of these sort of these things that define a website (laughs) of the era but what really sort of useful in developing a you know any kind of coherent discourse you know they were they were too locked in but when Blogger came out by Google, that sort of opened up the publishing. And I started Beef Aficionado anew as a sort of a daily blog. Uh, and that became, you know, what I, my hobby for, I mean, that was, that's what it was, my hobby, until I got hired by Serious Eats to review hamburgers. And from the hamburgers reviews, then I got the pizza reviews, then I became the local New York restaurant reviewer. Then I had a column called Statecraft. And and as my career evolved, you know, I, I became I specialized in beef, but then I sort of became a more general food writer and sort of rode the wave of the, what I consider the golden era of food blogging. It was a sort of 2005, 2006 till about 2010. Um, so that sort of four or five year period is when like Eater, Serious Eats, all of these you know, there was the New York Times had a food section, but that was that was an adjunct to a print mechanism. Serious seats and eater to me were the and then of course before that chow hounds and the mm-hmm. and the forum type things. Those were yeah. were the those were the first true purely digital food um, websites, and they sort of defined what food writing and and what food blogging became. So I was very lucky to work for both Serious Eats for seven years and then Eater for another three after that. Um, And during that time, I also did some local restaurant reviewing for a a, a commuter newspaper called AM New York. I worked with 0.0 to develop Pat LaFrieda's Big App for Meat, which is a iPad app that basically covers every readily available commercial cut of, of beef veal pork lamb and Mm. then poultry wow um i don't unfortunately i don't think that's been updated for the latest ios you know how like you have to you have to update your uh, app every time that apple i don't know because last time i checked it wasn't available but hopefully 0.0 is on that we're talking with nick solaris here on the show Uh, nick believe it or not time has completely evaporated and i've gotten to about 25 percent of of what i wanted to get to (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so well it's like like all good things it's dry aging absolutely so if you're uh if you're uh, open to it i'd love to get with you to to come back on uh, probably uh, another uh two or three times so we can uh yeah, you know actually still, talk about meat and you know uh what people are thinking and what's trending and all this other stuff but uh, this has been a, a great opening segment and i certainly appreciate it 
Thank you very much. And uh, I hope everyone looks out for my new show called Meat Life, which is premiering in the fall. We'll talk about that, too, next time you're on, I promise. Thanks very much. All Appreciate right. your time. There he is, Nick Solaris. Wow, what happened there? That was awesome. Oh, now, here we go. All guests appear via the Traeger Grills hotline. I'm telling you. <clears throat> yummy. It's like, you know you got a good guest on when I'm watching the clock tick down. And I'm like, uh-oh. I'm not going to get into the major points that I was looking to get into. Get that big stuff out of here. Good news. Nick's a great guest. So as long as he's amenable, I have him back on. But good backstory to Nick growing up, how he kind of got his chops within the industry. So looking forward to having him back on once again. His website, nicksolaris.com, S-O-L-A-R-E-S. On the Twitter, Nick underscore Solaris on Instagram, at Nick Solaris. So check him out. And we'll have him back on sooner than later. I want to really know about that new YouTube show coming up as well. Mike McLeod coming up out of the break. Let me talk to you quickly about Traeger Grills. Behind every great meal is a great grill, and not just any grill, a Traeger Grill. The Timberline is Traeger's most advanced to grill yet. It allows you to grill, smoke, bake, roast, braise, and barbecue like a pro, no matter what your level, thanks to the incredible wood fire taste. Seriously, you don't know flavor till you're cooking with it. Traeger Grills use all-natural hardwood pellets as fuel, so you're literally cooking with flavor from low and slow smoked ribs like I did this past weekend. To a seared steak, even a baked apple pie, Traegers can handle it all, and the Traegers Timberline makes it even easier thanks to the Wi-Fi capability. You can check on your cooks, kick up the temperature, set custom cook cycles anytime, anywhere, all through your Traeger Grill app. I should check on my brisket if I had one on. I could do it. If I had one on, I could do it right now, right from my phone, no problem. Find one at your local Traeger dealer or check them out online at TraegerGrills.com. Want to beef up your barbecue game? Yeah, you do. Traeger Shop Class going coast to coast, bringing barbecue knowledge and amazing wood-fired food everywhere they go. Taught by professional pitmasters, you'll take home all the skills you need to reach barbecue glory. Find a shop class near you and sign up today at TraegerGrills.com slash shop class. That's TraegerGrill.com slash shop class. DivaQ is in Wisconsin right now doing shop classes, believe it or not, so... Give all those pitmasters a follow, see what they're up to, and then if you have a pitmasters class coming by your neck of the woods, you got to sign up for it. Come on. You know you want to. Mike McLeod coming up next. Stick around. Be right back. Ready to get on the air? Call 216-220-0966. Now, let's get back to the LeBron James and Barbecue Talk. Craig Rampey. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets for all your pellet-driven cookers. Visit CookinPellets.com. That's C-O-O-K-I-N, CookinPellets.com, for more information or purchase. You can also visit Amazon.com and purchase Cooking Pellets from Amazon right there. Download the Amazon app or download the Cooking Pellets app. It's free. Get alerted to special deals when they're shipping out. Hey, hey. Thanks again to Nick Solaris joining me last segment. My next guest, the president and CEO of MMA Creative, also the creator of the World Food Championships. And tonight we'll be talking about a big change to this year's final table at WFC as well as some other Portions and ancillaries that are going on this year. So let's head back to the Traeger Grills hotline and welcome friend of the show, Mike McLeod joining me. Mike, how are you, buddy? Hey, Mr. Greg, I'm great. How are you doing? Absolutely fabulous, Mike. Always appreciate you making time for the show here. And uh, I guess if I could be candid for a moment, Mike, you know, I don't know if I when are thought, you not candid? well, I don't know. I mean, you know, this is all, uh, you know, Wit, wit and words here as we build suspense. But, you know, I don't honestly know if I thought that the World Food Championships would have seen the level of growth year over year when you launch back in 2012. This year, there already seems to be more local events and regional events, special events taking place that I recall seeing in past years. I mean, it has to be a really good and, and satisfying feeling from your end and the team's end to see the participation, not only from the contestants, but from companies wanting to get on board and some type of a sponsorship deal, you both seem to be 
moving along very well. And uh, I mean, I, I got to say, it's it's uh, congratulations to you. And and I'm wondering, you know, and we kind of always ask this every year when we kind of talk to you. But uh, do you continue to exceed expectation? Are you surprised that World Food Championships has become this popular? And what really is a short lifespan at this point? Yeah, I, th- I think so. Um, it, it has been uh, very exciting. It's, it's been moving at a fast pace. Um, it's been humbling and, and uh, exhilarating and exhausting all at the same time. Uh, but, you know, I think we we just we were in the right place at the right time seven years ago when we, we tapped into this uh, type of food sport cooking, and, and um, I think the indus- industry was ready. And we keep feeding it. We keep focusing on it. Um, and sponsors now know that we've stood the test of time. Uh, the the final table, which I know you want to talk about, um, doing that in Bentonville with with Walmart was a sonic another one of the sonic booms. Uh, so not not too surprised, but uh, pleasantly surprised uh, at certain aspects of it. Uh, I'm just I'm just delighted that that food champions from all walks of life are are uh, finding us and deciding to plug in. Let's talk about that final table or, or the change that was passed along to me from my Tennessee Embedded correspondent who'll actually be on next hour, Steve Ray, who messaged me and said, hey, Mike McLeod just got up in front of 1,500 people at this event we're having down in Tennessee and said that the World Food Championship's final table was going to be taking place Thanksgiving night on a major TV network. And I said, Steve, are you drinking? And he said, nope. I saw him do it. I said, well, that seems to go completely contrary to what happened just this past year where we had the World Food Championships in November. And then there was uh, uh, you know, a few months off to get everybody exposed and the publicity and kind of gearing up for that final table, which ended up taking place in April out at, uh, I believe it was Brightwater. So uh, I guess from from that aspect, how did it end up for you this year? Did it reach all the benchmarks and goals that you guys were hoping for? And then we'll broach into what potentially is a, a whole new final table for this year. Yeah. So first of all, Steve was not drinking. I was. <laughs> <laughs> that was the problem. Got it. <laughs> but, uh, and I was uh, absolutely stuffed with wonderful uh, Springer Mountain chicken farms uh dishes from five wonderful chefs four chefs down in chattanooga but uh so i'll start with your your uh first question there um the final tables the, the strategic decision we made which was not impacted by tv it was just by uh, by sheer desire and and looking at the landscape and and trying to yet again push the envelope which you you know that we have done year after year mm-hmm. in numerous ways. Um, the final table shift into April of last year, while a lot of people were, were, um, weren't big believers, uh, or, or thought that was some kind of just financial miscue or something. Um, I, I think that we were able to prove that that was, um, one of the best moves we've ever made. Uh, the final table, uh, focus for five months, from a marketing standpoint and a social media standpoint is one of the things I think that, that has led to this groundswell, you know, year over year, every, every year we measure our, our social metrics, our media metrics, our competitor growth, um, sponsor growth. We measure a lot of different things and across the board, everything is up and not just up, but like a uh, hundred to 300 percent up in, in mm. numerous different categories. So, it's uh, that that move will go down in history for us as one of the uh, smartest things we ever did, and it was wonderful to experience just to see the ten champions um, in a world class uh, environment uh, to to have you know Bo Jackson and to have a senior VP from from Walmart, uh, Katie Dixon, Mo Kason involved. It was just it was just a magical moment, and they're already referring to themselves as the class. Of, of 2017, which is another kind of neat little thing that keeps happening with with this event is it's kind of community esque. Um, it's like a homecoming in November, and now maybe the final table is always going to be like a uh, the class of 2018 or mm-hmm. 2019, whatever it works out to be. So, uh, very very happy with, with how that worked out, and um, we we are now kind of playing a little tug of war mentally with. Um, 
um, some opportunity that we have right that we're staring at right now, and and how that might uh, play with it a little bit further again. So um, I don't know if that's the segue you're looking for. Or if you yeah, want, I mean let's let's talk about uh, are you looking at a Thanksgiving night World Food Championships final table, and how does that work logistically with the World Food Championships because that's got to take place first before you can have a final yeah. table. Yeah, so we were, uh, and and this is the interesting thing about uh, TV in Hollywood. And of course, I don't know if you recall, but we we're now partnered up with uh, Dick Hart Productions. Yeah, right. Uh, who's le- leading leading our efforts in um, Hollywood and and doing a phenomenal job with that. Um, we for uh, about a hot minute, um, we were in um, this this go strategy for a two hour special. Uh, live on Thanksgiving night, and mm-hmm. as we 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 talk every single week, um, and we're because we're getting down to the nitty gritty of 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 having to pull the trigger on a strategy and yeah. then being able to deliver it and execute on that strategy. So <clears throat> it uh, it's it's moved a little bit. Um, we are still looking at a holiday type show. Uh, we are trying to figure out does it make sense uh, to do that as a um, main event TV show and then have a delayed final table again in the spring so that we can build anticipation with and have a second TV show. Uh, so we, the other cool thing uh, that keeps making this tough is that we're dealing with networks. We're not dealing with cable TV. We're mm-hmm. dealing with one of the, the major networks. So um, they have creatives, they have thoughts, they have a lot of moving parts on what is aired at certain times, especially during the holiday season. And um, we are, uh, we're, we're in that mix and trying to see where we land. I, I keep thinking every single day I'm going to, I'm going to be able to say, okay, this is it. Uh, let's, let's box it in and let's deliver it. Right. Um, but we, we keep getting thrown these curveballs, and of course, as you know, Walmart's involved, um, so we got a lot of constituents that we got to we got to uh, make sure that we do the right thing for. And uh, I would say probably, I probably should have told you earlier today, we could have postponed this a week or two. Maybe maybe I'd, maybe I'd have the answer. I'd be happy to come back and, and discuss it with you when we get it nailed down. Uh, so let me ask you this because it's my show, and I always love speculatory or, or what would you want to have happen? I mean, all things being equal, if you could just go in and dictate this is what's going to happen what would you like to see happen oh that's easy uh I, there would be a tv show uh that covers the main event and it wouldn't be a live situation but it just it'd be a good tv show on a major network and then we would have uh like survivor we would switch from american idol to a survivor strategy and we'd have final table uh new york final table seattle mm-hmm. final table dallas you know final table somewhere uh maybe even a Thailand, a China, et cetera, in the future. So we would do that in the spring. And, and I, you know, the thing that the World Series of Poker did for years has, has been one of those models that we emulated and one of the reasons that we decided to switch to April this year in the final table. We, I always thought that was a great formula. And I don't even know why ESPN changed it back. But, um, but that's TV. I mean, there, there's always someone smarter in the room. And um, it who knows what drives all these different decisions behind behind the curtains but there's certainly a lot of factors but uh, yeah i would i would have a two hour live final table somewhere in the world and the 10 champions would would have to cook a local dish they'd have to maybe cook in a local restaurant and then they'd have to face a local group of chefs in that market and it would be portable it would be episodic and it would be uh, epic, I think, from a uh, from a strategic standpoint. So, uh, so I keep I, I keep trying to get that in the in the in, in everyone else's mind that's in the room um, making this decision, and uh, I, I'm, I haven't been successful yet. But we're um, we're gaining ground on a, on a cool concept. Do you think that the long term success of World Food Championships has to be tied into television or? if it all went away in a year or two, it would still be as popular as ever? Or do you need the eyeballs on television to keep it in front of people's faces, say, hey, I could go do that, now you have more participants? Uh, that's 
that's kind of the feeling I'm getting here is you, you want to make sure that it is on television going forward uh, in some form or fashion to keep the eyeballs. It's a great question. Um, personally, uh, TV, I, I want it to always be on TV somewhere, somehow. Uh, TV drives a lot of different things, but an event doesn't have to have TV, TV to be successful. I mean, look at, you know, look at the Jack, look at uh, Memphis and May and, and the Royal. Uh, those things are not really televised. Um, they, they may have specials every now and then, but they're not uh, based on television contracts. Right. The difference, Greg, is is that you you start dealing with different kinds of budgets. When when you're at, at the event level and you're not televised, you're dealing with typically activation budgets uh, at a company, which are a lot smaller than media budgets. And if you can ever straddle that situation and get the media dollars allocated. So let's say uh, right now we got Lipton uh, tea and, and um, uh, the Pepsi house behind us, you know, their, their investment in the world food championship, which has been there for the last two, ever since it's been in orange beach uh, and will continue to be there. I think as, as long as we continue to do the right things, um, their, their investment becomes 10 X mm. or a hundred X if there's a TV show around it. Sure. So that's, that's the, the killer aspect of TV. Uh, all the budgets get bigger and, and notoriety becomes a, a bigger thing. You create more stars from the enterprise and it does feed on itself. So it does, uh, what I would say is it's a catalyst, right? It, 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 it really moves the needle faster and strategically um, in different directions than, a, than an event that does not have TV. You know, we proving that we've been on TV four out of six years. Uh, and I think that's one of the components to our success. Uh, we've it's all been on cable, and it's been different cable shows. Uh, but if we have a chance to be on a network show, would I move the final table back into uh, the same calendar year? Hell yeah. I mean, I, that's um, you can't – I would be stupid to miss that, right? I mean, that it may still be separated, or it may be tacked on at the end of the tournament again, like it has been in the past. But we would we would do that for the network visibility we would get. It's even though Food Network is is the thing, right? Everybody thinks once you hit Food Network, um, mm. you've made it. It's not the thing <laughs> when when you're dealing with NBC, CBS, ABC, or Fox. Those numbers um, dwarf uh, Food Network. So. Uh, it'd be like a, a shot heard around the world for World Food Championships if we can if we can get that nailed down. Mike McLeod joining me here, creator of the World Food Championships, the website worldfoodchampionship.com. Uh, Mike, I will probably take you up here uh, once you get everything nailed down here in a couple of weeks. We can come back on. Uh, we can also talk a little bit more about some ancillary categories and the, the big stake thing that was announced a week or so ago, and uh, we can yeah. hook up back then and, and see what's happening. Absolutely. Be happy to. All right. Mike McLeod, the creator of the World Food Championships. Mike, always appreciate the time, man. Thanks for coming on. Always fun. Thanks, Greg. You got it. There he is. Mike McLeod. Right there. Yeah, baby. All guests appear via the Traeger Grills hotline. Mm-mm-mm. Working the phones yeah, myself. Man. It's working itself. Doing it myself. So, potentially, as uh, the embedded correspondent Steve Ray said... Last week, after he had attended a World Food Championship uh, event of some sort, that Mike got on cam or Mike got on Mike, Mike got on Mike and said, "Hey, we could be launching Final Table this year, network television." So he didn't back all the way off of it. Just a little unsure exactly how that might look at this point, but. Could have him back in a couple weeks. We might redo the first hour with uh, Nick Solaris and Mike McLeod again. Who knows? That was a very quick first hour in case you were keeping track of time. You know what's a great cooker to have in your backyard, especially if you're looking to get into the pellet cooker scene? Green Mountain Grills. I've had one for six years, seven years, maybe a little bit longer than that. I have a Jim Bowie out back. That's the big boy. Can house many racks of ribs, especially if you're using the rib racks number of different pork butts. If you're going to pan them, a little less, but if you're just going to put them right there on the smoke, you can probably get six, seven, eight 
Easy, depending on how big they are. Middle model, yeah. Daniel Boone, no problem there either. Great for the smaller family. Maybe you got four or five people in your family or you're just not into cooking an incredible amount of smoked meat at any given time. Daniel Boone might be the one you want. Or if you're an outdoorsy person and you're always on the go, but you want to bring something along that can provide you with a nice barbecue flavor, smoked meat, even jack it up to do a little bit of grilling. The Davy Crockett, the most portable cooker out there right now when it comes to pellet cookers. All you have to do is keep it full of pellets. If you don't have access to a traditional electrical outlet, don't worry with a Daniel Boone. Or I'm sorry, with a Davy Crockett. All you have to do is use the 12-volt outlet in your car or truck or van or SUV. Very simple. And you're not sacrificing a ton of capacity for the portability. Doesn't get any better than that. Head on over to GreenMountainGrills.com. That's GreenMountainGrills.com to purvey all of the models that they're currently selling. And as I say each and every week, if you're going to do Daniel Boone or you're going to do Jim Bowie, make sure that you go out of your way to spend the extra 125 or 30 bucks or whatever it is to get that pizza of an insert. You're going to be extremely satisfied with it. The efficacy rate on that has got to be near 99.97%. I'm sure there's somebody out there that trashes it for no good reason other than they're just angry and bitter people. Everybody else is in love with the pizza oven insert for the Daniel Boone and the Jim Bowie. Works so well. Set your cooker at 350 degrees. Double it. That's the temperature you have in your stone. So about 700 degrees on the stone. You can go all the way up to 1,000 degrees. Cooker's going to hit 500 degrees. That'll be 1,000 degrees in the oven. You want real, traditional Neapolitan pie, thin crust, as high heat as you can go. Set it at 500. You got 1,000 on the stone. I'm not the guy that likes to live in that world. A lot of things can go wrong very quickly that you can't pull back. But, hey, if that's your style, you go ahead and do it. GreenMountainGrills.com. That's GreenMountainGrills.com. We're back to wrap the first hour right after this. Stick around. Be right back. Big name interviews, advice on cooking brisket and ribs, and the only host willing to share his honest opinion on all things important in the world of barbecue, it's the Barbecue Central Show. We are back after it. The segment brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or connect via the Bluetooth. If you have Alexa or Google Assistant in your house, you're in luck because Fireboard fully integrated with both. Constantly learning new skills. So tell Alexa or the Google Assistant to do this or that with the Fireboard. Find out more by visiting fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232. That's 816-945-2232. Trying to lock down Ted Conrad here for a segment update coming up here just as soon as he is available, but I know this is one of their busiest times of the year anyway, plus they're into some other technology. Thanks again to Mike McLeod from MMA Creative and World Food Championships talking about what might be a brand new final table look this year it was new last year could be new this year John Dawson weighing in ramps I've heard rumors no names please rule number one of the show that the 2019 World Food Championships final table will be held in 2021 at the International Space Station hell good job John John this is a only a reference that you and I will get I was actually on a conference call with Joe Pags, and I told him all about how you had mentioned him to me. Remember years ago, you sent me a link. You're like, hey, check out Joe Pags. I told Joe Pags about John from Patio Daddio in Boise. Believe it or not, true story. I don't have it on tape, though, but why would I make that up? It's a little inside thing between me and you, John. All right, we are looking towards the second hour here, Embedded Correspondence segment coming up. If you missed the first hour, subscribe to the podcast, and then you'll get it tomorrow on Wednesday. You'll get the second hour on Thursday. Great stuff. 
You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show right here on the Barbecue Central Network. Stick around. We'll be right back. 